I was a child of the 90s. As such, Pokemon was a staple of my childhood. That's not to say that it's faded into obscurity by any means, it's still a hugely successful multi-billion dollar franchise, but back when it was first released, you had no choice but to engage in Pokemon related media. It was everywhere. You had the Game Boy games, the trading card game, the anime series, the movie, and the hilarious media backlash from ignorant zealots who believed that anything bringing joy to children was satanic. Your children knew, need to know there's a devil and he hates them and he wants to ruin their life. Pokemon dominated the playground, and for many years it was a pop culture juggernaut, referenced or parodied by pretty much everyone. It even spawned a whole bunch of derivative franchises such as Digimon, Monster Rancher, and more recently, Yokai Watch. To be honest, it's hard to imagine a world without it, so to celebrate this media giant, I'm going to be covering its history over several videos. Well, the history of the games at least. I don't want to deal with the tight-fisted creators of the anime and their channel-destroying copyright hammers. So let's take a look at the games that started it all. The Japanese exclusives, Pokemon Red and Green. <laughs> Originally created by Satoshi Tajiri, the original Pokemon, or Pocket Monster games, were released on the Japanese Game Boy in 1996. They were a pair of near-identical RPGs that had you play as a young boy canonically named Red. Inspired by Tajiri's childhood obsession with bug collecting, the aim of the games were to go on a journey as a Pokemon trainer, pitting fights with and capturing 150 varied species of Pokemon, all at the request of a local scientist named Professor Oak. Due to certain species being exclusive to red or green, this monumental task required both versions of the games to be connected for trading purposes, heavily encouraging social interaction on the player's part. To be the very best, you had to take Pokemon on the go with you. So close. You need a friend to trade with. <laughs> This played heavily into the game's success, and fittingly enough, served as the foundation for the smartphone game Pokemon Go. However, not all Pokemon players were completionists. In fact, many would focus instead on training, evolving, and battling their Pokemon. With an incredibly simple yet deceptively deep combat system, in which Pokemon had to make use of the correct elemental attacks and defenses, Players could instead pour their time into creating a team of six unstoppable monsters, defeating gym leaders, taking down a criminal organisation, becoming a champion of the Pokemon League, and most importantly, beating your real life schoolyard friends, the bloody cheaters. Red and Green proved to be a massive success in Japan, which prompted an updated re-release in 1997 mainly fixing the horrendously ugly sprites so they'd no longer look like hot garbage. This game was called Pokemon Blue, and was used as the base for Pokemon's international release, the updated Pokemon Red and Blue versions we know and love worldwide. Hey little buddy, wanna ride? Pikachu! Yeah, whatever! <laughs> I'll be right back! Gotta catch them all. That was the slogan used to push Pokemon in the West, and oh boy, it worked on multiple levels. Not only did it encourage sales of both versions of the games, and with it, the player interactivity, it also encouraged kids to pursue all of the Pokemon merch. You can't be a master just by playing the games. You've got to collect the aforementioned trading cards, watch the show, see the movie, buy the toys. I mean, looking back, it's almost despicable 
in how blunt of a cash cow it was. I don't know, either we were too daft to acknowledge the brute force marketing, or we just appreciated its brutal honesty. Naturally, with all this push, Pokemon Red and Blue became more than just games. For kids, it quickly became a way of life, much to the annoyance of teachers at the time, who were quick to throw out bans. However, the hype got even more real after the mind-blowing reveal of a secret 151st Pokemon. Like, as kids who had the number 150 drilled into us, the concept of a secret Pokemon was earth-shattering. But sure as heck, it was there from day one. Mew, a Pokemon hidden in the game's coding, but completely inaccessible by conventional means. This reveal allowed Game Freak and Nintendo to start hosting Pokemon events, where Mew could be distributed. But it also opened some floodgates. Do you remember that one snot-nosed kid you hated in middle school? The one who would come up with heinous lies just to mess with you? I imagine most of you do. Either that or you were that kid. Well, back in the day, before rumours could be easily debunked using the internet, that kid, and many other jerkwads, were able to start pushing a number of rumours about fake Pokemon and how to find them. This led to a lot of upsettingly convoluted procedures and wasted time for players who were suckered in, with the most egregious example being the infamous falsehood that Mew was hidden beneath a hard to access and easily missable truck. Adding to this problem is the fact that Pokemon Red, Blue and Green were all very poorly coded. In this day and age where legitimate methods of catching Mew actually have been discovered, the glaring flaws of Generation 1 have become very apparent in retrospect. Not only was the combat system poorly balanced and easily rigged, but the games themselves seem to be held together with string and happy thoughts. Which is understandable for an expansive JRPG on the Game Boy, but can lead to sequence breaking, corrupted data, and battles with placeholder sprites like Missing No, the infamous glitch Pokemon who can clone items and break your in-game records. With these slight hiccups in mind, the original Pokemon games are still fantastically good fun. I like to revisit them every few months, sometimes for an authentic nostalgic experience, and sometimes to break the games over my knee and glitch them into oblivion, a joy that is sadly absent from the newer and more polished games in the series. Yes, I would actually argue that Pokemon Red and Blue were actually enhanced by their shortcomings. The logic is astounding, I know. Before moving on to the definitive Generation 1 game, let's briefly explore some of the spin-off titles, of which there were quite a few. First of all, there was the Japanese version of Pokemon Stadium. This Nintendo 64 game allowed you to transfer your Pokemon from the main games and battle them in full 3D. By which I mean you could only use 42 of the 151 Pokemon. And you'd have to battle obscenely tough trainers, including some real life world champions. Being more of a gimmick than anything else, this game was very limited, needlessly tough, not very fun, and didn't get a worldwide release. Its sequel, however, Pokemon Stadium 2, or just Pokemon Stadium as we know it, was better in every conceivable way. A battle looms over this place. It's a battle for destiny, a battle for glory, a battle for... Pokemon! Giving players access to all 151 Pokemon, boasting a far more reasonable difficulty, and introducing both a gym leader boss rush and some highly addictive minigames, Pokemon Stadium was a blast to play. I was a PlayStation kid, but I took every opportunity to leech this game from friends and family. And um, I've uh, just now realised that was kind of terrible of me. Sorry about that by the way. 
tying more into the anime, were Pokemon Puzzle League and Pokemon Snap. The former being a basic Pokemon reskin of Panel Day Pawn. You have what it takes to face your toughest opponent yet. The wall. I'm genuinely awful at puzzle games, and I'm told this one is actually quite tough, so... Yeah, this one is lost on me. Pokemon Snap, on the other hand, is a very unique concept that makes for a fun and interesting game. It's basically a heavily concealed rail shooter, which has you travelling in an automated buggy and taking photos of Pokemon in their natural habitats. I know it sounds dull on paper, but the numerous ways you can interact with Pokemon by which I do of course mean screw with Pokemon, leads to a lot of variables, secrets, and most importantly, bonus points. This one is definitely worth a try. Finally, back on the Game Boy you had Pokemon Pinball, which is exactly what you think it is, and the Pokemon Trading Card Game... games. You're probably baffled by these, wondering why you'd want to play a virtual card game as opposed to the genuine article. But there's an easy answer to that. The Pokemon trading cards were ridiculously expensive. For real, they were straight up highway robbery, and I am truly sorry for any parents who had to sink money into them. Honestly, just play these games instead. They are not bad by any stretch of the imagination. And the second one, which was a Japan exclusive, has been patched into English by fans. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at Pokemon Yellow, the special Pikachu edition of the game. Obviously, I'm not going to patronise you. You all know who Pikachu is, and I'm sure you can guess why a re-release of Red and Blue with his mug smeared all over it would sell like hotcakes. But there's a lot more to this game. First of all, the updated Pokemon sprites look really nice in this version. Well, from the front at least. They have a stronger resemblance to their anime counterparts, and some of them are even in cool action poses, overshadowing their modern appearances. Secondly is the neat little detail that sees Pikachu following you around outside of battle. No other Pokemon game reintroduced this as a feature until Heart Gold and Soul Silver on the DS. And even today, it's not a series staple, which is honestly a little bit sad. Considering you're on a journey with your Poke friends, it'd be nice to actually see that. And if that wasn't enough, you even have a bunch of anime influences. A goofy Team Rocket duo based on Jesse and James from the TV show, the inability to evolve Pikachu with a Thunderstone, and a minigame in which Pikachu could hit the sweetest waves, bruh. As well as these numerous additions, the game was polished up and scoured for glitches. Attempting to break Pokemon Yellow in the same way as its predecessors will often lead to crashes, soft resets, and occasionally a screaming nightmare. Be beautiful. So, aside from those little tweaks, the Generation 1 Pokemon games remain fairly consistent and fun to play, albeit blown out of the water by their Game Boy Advance remakes. For as popular as they got though, hardcore Pokemon fans were starting to drop off. Game Freak, the company that developed Pokemon, would need to pull out all the stops for the sequel, and they most definitely delivered. Sit tight, because soon we'll be taking a look at Pokemon Generation 2. Gold, Silver and Crystal. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed this video. I'm doing my best to keep things varied, but if you really want me to push for more Pokemon-centric content, please let me know in the comments. Also, please do all of those lovely social media things you do to help me out, 
And a big thank you to everybody supporting me on Patreon so far. The more support I get for these videos, the more of them I'll be able to produce. So thanks a bunch, and take care.